We're now going to hear from Holly Lawford Smith. Holly Lawford Smith is a political philosopher, women's rights activist, and creator of the website No Conflict, they said.org, which is gathering anecdotal evidence of the ways in which self ID, sex self ID impacts women. And she's uh, an academic also and going to tell us, uh, give us a talk about how trans activists are gaming intersectionality and how gender critical feminism should not be intersectional. So welcome, Holly, and over to you. I'm going to start with something biographical, uh, which for me is where my questions about intersectionality uh, became serious. So uh, in 2019, a group of us in Melbourne were in the process of setting up a radical feminist group. Um, at the first meeting, something happened which I experienced as dissonant, um, but which I also felt like I couldn't ask questions about. So uh, as we went around saying what radical feminist issues we were passionate about uh, and wanted the group to work on, um, two women of colour said that it was uh, important for the group to work on racism. I thought um, that's odd, um, racism and feminism, two different issues. Uh, and then immediately, as if they were provoked by those women's contributions, um, a woman with a physical disability said that it was also important uh, for the group to work on discrimination against people with disabilities. I thought, again, that's odd, aren't ableism and feminism two different issues? And I started to worry about all the further social justice issues that there are that might be affecting different women at the table and which might then be put forward for our group to work on. So I wanted to work on feminism and I worried that these further issues were changing the subject. Some of you who are listening might be thinking, yeah, yeah, that sounds like typical white woman reasoning. Um, so for a certain kind of white woman, namely the middle class, able-bodied, heterosexual, non-trans white woman, uh, the only thing that oppresses her is her treatment on the basis of her sex. So she rather selfishly wants to protect a feminism that takes care of all and only her issues. But I think the same reaction might have been had by any woman at that table. A woman of color who understood the way that racism and sexism could come together and wanted at least some anti-racism issues to be part of the group's focus might still have had the same reaction as me to the idea that the group should work on discrimination on the basis of disability, let's say. I think any woman at that table belonging to any combination of social groups might have thought, well, that issue is not a feminist issue. Now, if that table, instead of being the first meeting of strangers in our city's only radical feminist cafe, uh, had been one of the round tables in a philosophy seminar room on my campus, I think I would have felt perfectly free to ask, hey everyone, um, I'm feeling confused. These issues strike me as something other than feminism. Can someone please explain to me how we're conceiving of radical feminism and what its agenda is? Can someone explain to me how all these issues, which at least appear to me as further issues, are in fact impossible to disentangle from feminism or should be part of any feminism worth its salt? In the philosophy seminar room, these kinds of questions are okay. Around that table, and I suspect in many newly formed feminist groups, they're not. We worry about not being in the know, about saying the wrong thing, about offending other women, and about coming across like a bigot. Indeed, not long afterwards, when a smaller group of us had broken away from the main group to work on opposing the sex self-identification legislation that was announced in Victoria that year, my asking of some of those questions caused quite a bit of trouble. So we'd had posters designed for an event that we were having on my campus on the future of sex-based rights. Two women in the group wanted us to add statements about Indigenous land rights to all of the marketing materials for the event. I asked why, because again, it struck me that Indigenous land rights, as important an issue as that is, are not obviously a feminist issue. And in particular, do not obviously have anything to do with an event about the future of sex-based rights. First, I was accused of racism for asking. And then when I defended myself, I was accused of white fragility. 
So this caused a rift between the women in the group and the two women making the accusations ended up leaving the group, which left us short on volunteers to run the actual event. I think that these reactions and what would have happened if I'd asked these questions at that very first meeting of the group can be explained by the understanding of intersectionality that has made its way into the popular culture. And I put it that way, rather than just saying can be explained by intersectionality, because I think there are important differences between what the academic theorists were actually trying to get at and then how some of these ideas have in fact been taken up and implemented. So what seems to have made it through into the popular culture is the idea that there are many different axes of oppression, for ex example, race, sex, class, sexual orientation, being trans and more. Then there is the idea that these axes can interact or make each other worse, and maybe even that they can't really be disentangled from each other. And finally, there's a kind of implicit hierarchy. We have a rough sense of which axes of oppression are better and worse, and we roughly believe that being impacted by two is worse than being impacted by one, being impacted by three is worse than being impacted by two, and so on. And all of this means we can always come up with a rough hierarchy in any given group based on a person's belonging to various social groups. And then there are norms about how to treat people depending on where they sit in that hierarchy. The more oppressed a person is, the more it is the case that they should be deferred to. Some other versions are popularized versions of academic ideas come in here too, like the idea that a person's unique lived experience gives her knowledge that people without that experience don't have, and that in turn justifies deferring to those people on matters related to that experience because they know more than you, or you have ignorance where they have knowledge. All of these ideas have something to them, but they can be overdone. So the norm that I would have been violating in that first meeting had I questioned the inclusion of race and disability within our group's radical feminist agenda would have been deference to the worst off women. As a white woman, I'm expected to defer and asking those questions would have involved asserting myself as an equal. Asserting myself as an equal, treating all other women in the group as equals, both to myself and to each other, comes to mean failing to acknowledge privilege and to perform the social signals that we have developed on the left for acknowledging and repudiating that privilege. Similarly, when I later questioned the addition of claims about Indigenous land rights on our events marketing materials, it was very much failing to perform those signals. For those people outside Australia, which I assume is most of you in the audience tonight, there's a very strong social norm here of acknowledging Indigenous land rights in the context of public events, no matter their focus. And this is in part because Australia has failed to make any reparations for historic injustice. But I think inside of feminisms that is concerned centrally with sex caste, which I think both radical feminism and gender critical feminism are, it makes absolutely no sense to consider women as privileged. The movement is simply not about putting all axes of oppression together and seeing who is the worst off and working on that. That would be the approach of a generalized movement for global justice, but it's not the approach of a movement for women's sex-based rights and interests. Catherine McKinnon referred to the, this idea of the privileged woman as woman modified. She said, woman discounted by white, meaning she would be oppressed, but for her privilege. Her feminism centers sex. She says, women's situation combines unequal pay with allocation to disrespected work, sexual targeting for rape, domestic battering, sexual abuse as children, and sy systemic sexual harassment, depersonalization, demeaned physical characteristics, use in denigrating entertainment, dep deprivation of reproductive control, and forced prostitution. And of white women, and the way the concept of the privileged white woman is used inside feminism, she says, what is done to white women can be done to any woman and then some. This does not make white women the essence of womanhood. It is a reality to observe that this is what can be done and is done to the most privileged of women. This is what privilege as a woman gets you, most valued as dead meat. 
it's not remotely obvious that in any group of women, the one who will have had the worst experiences in virtue of her sex will be the one with the most identity features according to the popularized understanding of intersectionality. The wealthy straight white woman might have suffered a horrific childhood of sexual abuse and the working class lesbian woman might have suffered only some sexual harassment and moderate verbal homophobia. So before I go on to explain how these ideas are allowing middle class white men to claim to be the most oppressed, let me make just one clarification in what I'm saying about privilege. It's not that radical and gender critical feminists should reject all ideas about privilege. Indeed, they shouldn't. The concept of male privilege is important. So for the relevant axis of oppression like sex, there would generally be a group with disadvantage and a group with advantage. And it can be useful for feminists to talk about male privilege and to expect men to do the work to unlearn that privilege. Indeed, some of the opposition to having men with gender identities using women-only spaces is that those men are likely to bring male privilege into the space. The difference is in focusing on the privilege of those who are, are advantaged by the axis of oppression relative to the movement. So for radical and gender critical feminism, that is male slash female. So it's men and only men who have privilege in that context. That doesn't mean women can't have privilege in other contexts, they can. If an able-bodied woman goes to a disability rights activism meeting, she may appropriately be seen as having able-bodied privilege and be expected to defer to those with the relevant disadvantage or take steps to unlearn that privilege, including ways of seeing and relating to people with disabilities. The same goes for the white woman at the Black Liberation meeting. My point here is one about privilege and deference between women inside radical and gender critical feminism. And even that needs qualification because of course no activist group is going to be successful if its members have discriminatory or otherwise shitty attitudes toward other members of the group. So of course radical and gender critical feminists need to not be racist, homophobes, ableist and so on. That's a precondition of working together effectively across diversity. But that is a very different thing to putting all of the social justice issues in existence onto the feminist agenda. Okay, onto middle class white men and how they end up being perceived on the left as the most oppressed. I'm not, by the way, claiming that all men with gender identities are white and middle class. I'm just taking this cohort as the most dramatic illustration of the point. So imagine, if you will, a male presenting, fully male bodied person who identifies as a woman and wants she, her pronouns, or a male presenting, fully male bodied person who identifies as non-binary and wants to use they, them pronouns. Suppose that these men are both middle class and both heterosexual, that is, are males attracted to females. For the person who maintains a sex slash gender identity distinction, meaning who thinks a person's sex is one thing and his gender identity is another, such men have one and only one social group membership that makes them disadvantaged, namely having gender identities. But for the leftists who have become convinced that gender identity somehow transforms sex, the identifications of these middle-class white heterosexual men catapult them to the bottom, or at least near the bottom of the intersectional pile. The man becomes a woman and so is disadvantaged along the axis of sex. The woman is attracted to women and so is disadvantaged along the axis of sexual orientation. And the woman is still trans and so is disadvantaged along the axis of gender identity. So one point of disadvantage magically becomes three and our middle-class white straight man is suddenly a middle-class white lesbian trans woman. An example of this exact reasoning showed up in an Australian news article last year. So Western Sydney University professor Jane Usher was quoted in an ABC news article about sexual harassment and violence against trans women saying, it's because they are women, because they are trans, because they are a woman of color, and many of whom were bisexual, queer, or lesbian. So these different multiple identities put them at high risk of sexual violence. She's describing someone born male as a woman, 
a woman of color and queer or lesbian in addition to being trans. Even if we're talking about a straight male person of color, two becomes four. So person of color plus trans becomes woman plus woman of color plus lesbian plus trans. So from this one entirely subjective identity claim, we get oppression along four axes and a strong claim therefore to being the most oppressed. Middle-class straight white men start outranking middle-class white lesbians or middle-class straight women of color in the intersectional hierarchy. And this is absurd. The absurdity is both in thinking that gender identity transforms sex, which has knock-on effects for how we think about sexual orientations and compounded oppressions like being a woman of color, and in thinking in terms of total oppression hierarchies in the first place. So what's the solution? We solve the problem of men ending up anywhere on the feminist intersectional hierarchy by refusing the idea that gender identity transforms sex and insisting upon the sex slash gender identity distinction. Sex is one thing, gender identity is another, and that is that. Radical and gender critical feminists are interested in sex caste and so female people. An intersectional approach to radical feminism might mean being interested in a lot of other identity features of female people, but that never takes us to male people. So men gaming the system is thus ruled out. But we can't solve the problem of the feminist agenda coming to include all or almost all issues and the problem of hierarchies between women inside feminism without getting rid of the understanding of intersectionality that has made its way into popular culture. I think that radical and gender critical feminists should commit, perhaps should recommit, to the centrality of women as a sex caste. I think that for the most part, radical and gender critical feminism should not be intersectional. Uh, it's a feminism for all women, but a feminism for all women as women, not as full persons. It should not be expected to speak to all aspects of women's personhood, just as no other social, move, social justice movement does. So consider, for example, Black Lives Matter or Extinction Rebellion. It's perfectly okay for a feminism to focus on one system of oppression, namely oppression on the basis of sex. And that means it's okay to bracket other issues even other issues that affect women, but affect them not as women, but as people. So some issues really are changing the subject. The challenge for us all, if we commit to this, is discerning when something is a women as women issue and when it's a women as people issue. So one heuristic is to ask when the issue, uh, whether the issue affects women of the social group more than men of the social group. So suppose a Filipino woman in Australia is struggling to get work and suggests to her local RADFEM group that they put employment for Filipino women on their agenda. We might then look at whether Filipino women are struggling with employment more than Filipino men. Suppose we find it's roughly equal. Then we might think this is a race issue, not a feminist issue. And the group might then quite reasonably refuse to put this issue on their agenda. And this won't make them racist, only focused feminists. The remaining complication is for cases of what may be referred to as the compound oppression that can arise when two axes of oppression mix together. So Angela Davis, for example, talks about the fact that black women under slavery in the US were subject to both slavery and sexual exploitation by the slave owners. As Davis puts it, the master would be subjecting her to the most elemental form of terrorism distinctly suited to the female, rape. This is a way that black women are treated but black men are not, and yet it is a form of domination that is made easier by slavery. It will be difficult to argue that it's either really a race issue or really a sex issue. It looks like both in a way that's uh, more than either combined. But because of its sexual element, it also looks clearly like a women as women issue. So there might be some compound oppressions between being female and other social group features that are novel in this way, and so create a difference with men of that same group, and yet are not plausibly about women as women. And in that case, my suggested heuristic won't work. 
So we do all need to have a further discussion about whether we think radical and gender critical feminism should be exclusively about women as women issues and exactly what we think that means or about women as women issues and all of the compound oppression issues that intersect with being female. The first produces the narrowest agenda but the compound oppressions may fall through the cracks if most social justice movements focus on a single axis of oppression, like I think feminism should recommit to doing. Thank you.